Why do I need to read in English? My students often ask me this. They think, I go to classes, I do my homework, I watch films in English. Why should I read books? Actually, reading is the best way to improve your English. I will tell you why. First, reading is very important. Not only did one in four people go to university, now more people go to university. All jobs require more reading and writing than years ago. This is true for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're an office worker or a mechanic. Second, reading will improve your speaking, writing, vocabulary, and grammar better than any other way. It won't improve your listening, but it will improve your vocabulary. And when you have a better English vocabulary, you can listen more easily and improve your listening that way. In school, you probably read lots of English. You probably read boring textbooks and stories with exercises at the end, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about reading for pleasure. That means reading a book you enjoy because you enjoy it. You are not reading because your teacher said, read this book. You are not reading because you think, I should read this book. You are reading because you want to. In the experiment in schools in America, they gave some boys free books. They were fun books, like James Bond. They said, you can do what you want. You don't have to read the books. But the boys did read the books. They read a lot of books. Some boys read a book every two days. After years, they gave the students a test. The students who got the books got better at reading and writing, and they liked school more. The students who did not get the books did not get better at reading and writing. Actually, some of them got worse. This isn't just true for native speakers. They also did an experiment on students learning English in the Fiji Islands. They tested three ways to teach. The first way was normal English teaching. They did grammar classes, exercises, and so on. The second way was reading in silence. The students read books in class. The third way was reading together. The teacher read books to the students. After one year, the two ways with reading were the best. They were much better than the students who did normal English classes. They did the experiment again in Singapore. There, the students who read in silence did very well. They did the best in grammar tests. Other students did grammar classes, but they did worse in grammar tests. In normal classes, we try to remember grammar and vocabulary. When we read, we learn them naturally. Maybe you're thinking, when I read in English, it's too hard. I have to use the dictionary all the time. It's boring. I can't do it. I understand. So, I wrote this book. I think this book will make you like reading because the stories are easy and fun. The early stories are short and easy and the later stories are longer and harder. When you finish the book, you will think, wow, I did it. I make a podcast called English Listening Practice. Nine of the stories in this book I wrote for English Listening Practice. One of the stories I wrote for this book. But when I made this book, I made the stories better. Now, you can read the stories at beginner, pre-intermediate, intermediate, or advanced levels. The stories are all fairy tales. Some are very popular fairy tales, but some are not so popular. One of them, I wrote myself. Maybe you're thinking, fairy tales are for children. I need useful vocabulary. I need to learn about business and science. That can't be fun. Actually, the vocabulary in these stories will be useful. McQuillan did an experiment where he looked at vocabulary in novels. 
80% of the words were on academic word lists. These are lists of words that you need to know to study at university. Rolls and Rogers also did an experiment. They said, If students read a million words of science fiction, will they learn important science words for studying at university? The answer was yes. So yes, fairy tales are useful for you too. But I understand if you still don't believe me. When I learned about all this, I found it hard to believe too. But I like to try new things, and I love learning languages. So, in 2017, I decided to do an experiment. I had wanted to learn Spanish for a long time, but I didn't learn much in normal classes. I said, I will read a million words in Spanish. Afterward, I will see what my level is. A million words is about 40 novels, so it was a lot of work. I started with very easy reading like this book. Then I started reading translations of books that I knew in English. For example, I have read Harry Potter and Game of Thrones in English, so I read them in Spanish, too. Finally, I read new books in Spanish. I read Latin American authors, that means writers such as Isabel Allende, Luis Jorge Borges, and Manuel Puig. I love them. I also listen to podcasts, but I always read the transcripts and added the words to my goal. After I finished reading a million words, I wrote and talked to native speakers. I was at an intermediate level. I could understand almost everything I read. I could understand people when they spoke clearly, and I could have conversations. I had spent most of my time reading, not speaking. In one year, I learned more than most students learn in two years. I didn't try to remember grammar and vocabulary. I learned them naturally. Maybe you're thinking, I don't believe this. Or maybe you're thinking, wow, I'm going to read for hours every day. But I have to say something very important. You must read books that are easy and fun. If a book is too difficult or too boring, put it down and find another one. Stephen Krashen, an expert in language teaching, says, Only read things in English that are fun and interesting. Read things that are really easy, that you wouldn't read in your native language because they are too easy. So, you can read comics, magazines, detective stories, romance stories, and so on. Don't feel bad about reading translations. If you read very easy books, when you see a word you don't know, you will understand the meaning easily. You won't have to use a dictionary. So, what is easy? Experiments show that you should understand at least 98% of the words in the text. 98%? That's so high, I know. But let me show you an example. Here's a text where 50% of the words are not real words, so you should understand 50% of the words. Jerry Fleer Ed out of bed and opened the curtains. He bammed to himself as he made breakfast. He made coffee and put butter on his puffer. Someone called his phone and he picked it up. He was very surprised by who was tingling, so his inky fell on the floor. Is that easy to understand? Could you read a whole book of that? Here is the same text, but only 2% of the words are not real. So you should understand 98% of the words. Jerry jumped out of bed and opened the curtains. He sang to himself as he made breakfast. He made coffee and put butter on his toast. Someone called his phone and he picked it up. He was very surprised by who was calling, so his inky fell on the floor. How was that? You probably didn't understand everything, but it was more fun to read than the first text. 
That's why reading for pleasure is so great. Maybe you don't understand everything, but you understand enough to follow the story, and you don't have to pick up a dictionary. So, if you find that this book is too hard, read something easier. If you find it boring, read something more fun. I know that not everyone likes my writing, and that's okay. Find a book that is good for you. When we have fun, we learn much more. Because I want this book to be fun, it has no exercises in it. I thought about adding them after each story, but I don't think it's a good way to spend your time. Instead, you should read more, read for pleasure. If you finish this book, you can try the level above. Because you already read the stories, you will know them well, and it will be easier to understand. But maybe when you finish this book, you will love stories. I hope so. If you do want to read more, you can listen to my podcast, English Listening Practice. I write a new story every week with audio and text, and there are over a hundred episodes for you to listen to. We can improve our English with such beautiful stories. Let's listen to this story. This will improve your English speaking skills unprecedentedly. Do you want to improve your English? Do you want to speak English more fluently? You see, the English language changed my life. I was born in Hong Kong. So, English is not my first language. My first language is actually Cantonese. My second language is Mandarin, because my mother is from Taiwan. And my third language is English. So, when I first immigrated to North America, I couldn't speak a word of English. And I know some of my fans have said that you're tuning into my videos because you want to learn how to speak the English language. I find that that's kind of interesting. So, today I want to share with you five steps to improve your English fluency. The five things that I did to learn the English language. Step number one to improve your English fluency, it's actually very simple, and that is, don't give a damn. That's right, don't give a damn. Speak whenever, wherever, however. It doesn't matter if you speak with an accent. I still speak with an accent, and I talk to tens of millions of people every single month. It doesn't matter. Forget how people would judge. Forget how people would think of you. All this stuff. It doesn't matter. Just speak as much as you could. If they don't understand you, say it again. If they don't understand you, say it again. You just keep saying it. I remember because I spoke with such a thick accent, I spoke like it sounded like Jackie Chan. I can still speak with some Chinese accent like hey, yeah, this, then that, like that kind of stuff. But you just speak. You just speak as much as you could because that's how you get comfortable. You would not guess if you're always thinking about, oh, to understand a culture, to understand philosophies, you need to understand the language. So, when I learn the English language, then I also learn about a lot of other things about the culture, about business. Of course, that's what I do. So, language is not just that you use to communicate. Language is also something that you could train your mind with. So understand that. Step four, immersion. You have to immerse yourself. So when I was learning the English language, what I did is I would listen to music every single day. I would listen to English music, English songs, and try to sing along and just to learn it, right? It was very, very difficult, and I was listening to rap music, which is way too difficult. I gave that up, but I was watching English movies without subtitles, and I would listen. And at first, I wouldn't understand. 
I would understand maybe 5% of it, right? And then I would understand, I think, oh, that's what she means. And 10%, 20%, as my English improves, I noticed I would understand the movie more and more and more, right? So you have to immerse yourself. Talk in English, listen to English music, watch English movies. Do as much of that as you could. Naturally, you'll pick up the slang. You'll pick up certain stories or phrases, that kind of phrases. That's how you learn the English language. Then, you make it fun. So, it doesn't have to be you have to sit down and study, oh, I'm studying the language. No, make it fun. Talk to people who speak English, right? Like interact, connect, read, watch, listen. That's how you get good. That's how I got good. Step number five, to improve your English fluency. And that is to hang out with people who speak English. Like, I know it sounds so obvious, but that's how you do it. I remember in college, you will see these groups of people, and I would see the Chinese students only hang out with Chinese students. I would see the Korean students hang out with Korean students, and Japanese students hang out with Japanese students, right? And I would do the opposite. I would go and hang out with people who speak English. I would hang out with Caucasians. I would hang out with people who grew up locally, who speak perfect English, and I would just talk and hang out. We go to the library, and I would try to talk as much as possible, listen, ask questions, write, to get comfortable. And another thing that I did was actually, I got a Korean girlfriend who speaks English, right? So that's another way to do it. So I'm not saying that's the only way to learn, but if you want to learn a new language, take who speaks the language. You'll be shocked how quickly you pick that up, right? How quickly you can pick up the language. Let me give you a bonus tip, a bonus step if you want it, okay? Step number six, and that is going into a state of overlearning. Let me explain. If you are thinking about, let's say, learning a language, let's say you're here and you want to get to this good, the fastest way to get to this good is you actually go into a state of overlearning. Let's take an exercise example, okay? If you want to have a stronger bicep, let's say you're only doing your curl. You can only hypothetically lift 20 la bar, right? That's much of strength you have. If you want to make that 20 LB, easy to better lift that up, guess what? Train with 25 la Train with 30 LB. That's an over preparation, over learning. That's what I mean, right? You want to stay over learning. So, what I did, because I'm in business, right? Not only learning the English language, I was learning how to sell, how to close, how to do marketing. So, not only just the English language day to day basis to communicate, but actually at a way higher level where there's something to lose where it's not just learning the basic day-to-day -day communication, but also there's money involved, right? How I became a fluently English speaker alone. Now, I'm sure that you have had moments in your learning where you have felt like you progressed very quickly. It comes easily. You're motivated, it's fun, but at some point, you hit a wall and you feel like you'll never speak fluently, confidently, and naturally. You are not alone. This feeling of being stuck is often called the intermediate plateau, and I've been there. It can be a comfortable place. You can speak and understand in many situations. But for most of us, it's not enough. We want to enjoy the language as freely as we do our mother tongue, as a native. I've never had the experience of learning English as a second language, 
So I want to bring you an expert who has successfully done it here at Real Life English. And if you listen to our podcast, chances are you have already heard me on there. But today, I'm here to tell a little bit of my story and how I went from speaking zero English to the level of English I have today. I'm just like you. I'm an English learner myself, and I had to learn English from scratch in my country here in Brazil. I've never been abroad, so I'm going to tell you how I did it. And hopefully, that's going to give you some ideas and inspiration for your English journey. But before we get started, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the bell down below, because every week we put out videos to help you speak English with confidence and naturally. So, now, let's get started. So, my story with English began when I was 15 years old, and as I told you, I come from Brazil, and at that time, I knew zero English. You know, I couldn't speak anything, I couldn't read, I couldn't write, but, um, at 15, something magical kind of happened, because I started to have this desire to become bilingual. I don't know exactly why that was. But the idea of using two languages to communicate, to express myself, was very attractive to me. And I remember also that I looked around me, you know, I saw my family, my friends, you know, my social circle, and I realized that no one knew English. So I started to associate also the idea of knowing English with having a better life or having school. He took an English course, and he was really helpful because I talked to him, and he was kind enough to lend me his old course books, you know, because every semester his school would change the books. So the books that he wouldn't use anymore, he would lend them to me. So that's how I started. I started by studying with old course books from my friend and a grammar book that he had lent me foreign studying by myself with those old books, you know. And I remember that I was really fascinated because English was always interesting to me. I always loved the language, but I was then actively studying it, right? I mean, I was reading stuff in English, I was copying stuff from the book that I saw, and I was already very excited because I was using another language to write or to communicate, or to express myself. Uh, my speaking was really, really bad at that time, you know. So I couldn't speak yet, even though I grew up kind of watching movies with my parents in English and listening to music in English as well. I didn't have my speaking skills. So, developed yet. I remember that I would try to read, uh, stuff out loud from the books that I was studying with, and it was a disaster because, you know, the words wouldn't flow. I had no idea how to pronounce certain words. Words, for example, low, labdo, you know. It was really bad and frustrating, but I kept going because at the end of the day, that was all I did for pretty much three years, you know, from 15 to 18. Most of the time, I would study with books, and that was the first mistake I made, and I'm here to tell you this because I took way too much time, too long to start speaking. You don't want to do that, and at that time, 20 years ago, it was much more difficult to find people to practice my speaking with. So I just studied with books at that time, but nowadays, we have so many more cool resources, you know, like apps. And speaking of apps, I can tell you about the real-life English app, as you probably know. And with the app, you can have conversations with people from all around the world at the touch of a button, plus you can listen to our podcast there, and with the transcripts, it's just amazing. So, if you haven't downloaded the app yet, Make sure you do that, because, you know, that is one of the resources that 
For example, I wish I had when I was learning English and trying to improve my speaking twenty years ago. Music. But then, something magical happened in my life when I turned eighteen. I started working, and I have to say that my work experience, you know, the jobs that I've had in my life, they were crucial in my English development, especially the speaking and the listening skills. Let me explain. My first job was at a drugstore, and I worked as a cashier there. But there was something interesting about that drugstore, because that peers, they would see me at lunchtime, kind of eating and studying at the same time. So pretty quickly, I became the English guy at the drugstore. So every time a foreign customer came in, I was the one to be called. Hey, Chicago, there's a there's a foreign person there, a foreign customer. Go help that person. Then I would go there and then speak in English with those people and try to help them out. Right? I remember one time, it was kind of funny. You know, I was at the cash register and I was talking to this American customer. She was a lady, and then, you know. I was trying to talk to her in English and explain to her that I had never been abroad and everything, but I was still learning the language. And then I said, "Oh yeah, I've never been abroad." And then she kind of stopped me, and then she said, "Oh, I think you mean abroad." And I was like, "Oh, abroad. Oh, thank you very much for the correction. I appreciate that." So, that was a、uh, one example, yeah, of how having these little interactions with these customers helped me because, you know, sometimes I would say something wrong like abroad, and then the person would help me by correcting me, and I had many of these small interactions at that time that were really useful, and this is another tip that I can give you: be open to correction. Because if somebody corrects your English or your pronunciation or the way you use a word, this is actually great for speaking to Americans on the phone six hours a day, six days a week for a year. So that, in a way, it was my version of living abroad. You know, it was my version of having an exchange program because I was really speaking to natives for a year. Yeah, and that really helped me with my speaking skills and my listening skills. But it's important to mention that I only got that job because I already knew English enough to get that job. So all those years that I spent before, you know, working and studying and learning paid off because those years allow me to get this job, and then I improved even more. So, here's what I have to say to you. Keep learning, keep developing yourself, and start looking for job opportunities that allow you to use your English on a daily basis. Because then you're going to improve even more. And between those jobs, that was actually the moment when I really started to create my own immersion in English now, because I was already kind of using English on my daily routine there at work. And then I was really serious about it, like, you know, everything I made sure that I did in English. So, watching movies in English series, listening to music. I love rock and roll, for example. So, you know, I always listen to my favorite bands in English, and with my very first paychecks, actually, that's what I did. We didn't have Netflix at that time or streaming services. So I actually would go to media to learn English. By the way, if you want to learn or to know my exact step-by-step -step process that I used to improve my English with movies and TV series, let us know in the comments. Maybe I can make another video in the future for you, explaining how I did it. All right. Finally, there is one weird thing that happened in my life that really helped me take my English to the next level, and that was becoming an English teacher. You know, 
I started teaching English at 21 years old, so it's been 14 or 15 years now already. And I have to say that teaching English and helping people with their English was actually an experience that really helped me master the English language to a whole another level because, you know, when you teach, it's like you are learning again, you know. Because if I have to teach a class or help someone, I have to prepare, right? I have to study the topic myself. I have to be familiar with the topic. I have to think of different ways to explain things, to give examples. And that mental process really helps me better understand the topic, so then I can explain that to my students. So it's a win-win. If you teach somebody, you win because you are kind of revising information and studying it again, and the other person is also benefiting because the person is learning new stuff with you. And I've had the pleasure of working with wonderful, more experienced teachers, you know, over the years.